Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch, because otherwise it's not fair to talk about fairness on empty stomach. <laughs> um, thank you for joining me today. So all actors in the field are working intensively on policy design for the use and development of AI. All initiatives put in the center the call for AI to be fair, ethical, and just. But what, is it, what does exactly it mean? It's an open question that I will try to unpack in this presentation using a multidisciplinary approach. So the computer science literature refer to more than, different, tw more than 20 different notions of fairness. Each paper spent a lot of time on arguing why the suggested notion of fairness is the fairest, the most just, uh, and the most ethical. In my paper, in my presentation, I argue that the complexity of the various policy domains that algorithms are implemented in require different solutions. Therefore, there is no hierarchy between the different notions of fairness, and one is not superior over to the other. So the legal and social frameworks surrounding each policy domain require a notion that is tailored to, the unique, to its unique characteristics. What I'll do is that I will address the three main uh, groups of fairness notions in the computer science literature. Uh, I will address the subnotions of each group, determining to which policy domain each one of the fairness notions um, is most suitable for. Let's start with individual fairness, the first group. The focus of this group is the individual, regardless of his or her group affiliation. And the idea is that everyone is equal in front of the law. The first sub-notion in this group is the unaware approach. Um, it's called for equal protection, but in a traditional way of viewing equal protection as colorblind. Uh, so the algorithm should be blinded and unaware of any differences between people and the only prohibited attribute attributes by law, such as sex or gender, cannot be included in the algorithm. Legally, we already know that color blindness doesn't work because success is not just a matter of effort and talent, but also a matter of access to resources that you have or don't have depends on your group affiliation. Computationally, it's very easy to design an algorithm that doesn't take into account race or gender, but there are many factors that could serve as proxies for the pr protected attributes. I think that individual fairness in the unaware approach can work only in cases where the group of people that we are comparing between is quite homogenic. Still in the realm of individual fairness, fairness through awareness call for treating similarly situated people similarly, not everyone. Um, Legally, the idea behind this approach is that regulation by its nature seeks to differentiate between individuals. And the question to ask are when it's legal to classify people and what is the basis for the classification? So I will demonstrate with an example. In the criminal justice, imagine that there is a study that shows that uh, if you are a black defendant, and if you have five priors or more, you will be considered risky. But if you are a white defendant, and you have two priors or more, it's enough to consider you as risky. The similarly situated individuals will be black defendants with five priors or more, and white defendants with two priors or more. Uh, this notion is quite promising, but it's very hard to determine the matrix, the computational matrix that will identify the similarities between individuals. Group fairness approaches is the, the second biggest group. It includes many sub-notions that the common denominator between all of them is that not all groups have the same starting point in life. The best is to integrate differences in the equation and not to ignore them. Legally, group fairness equal affirmative action basically favoring a group of individuals um, that have been historically disadvantaged in order to give them an equal starting point. Affirmative action is a civil mechanism that could, um, 
that has been approved in court and by the legislator in a very narrow set of cases. And these are the cases that can be used uh, in, in, in the computational sense as well. The first group notion approach is decoupling. It's called for creating one algorithm per group. So Compass, a risk assessment tool used in criminal justice, have two versions, General Compass and Compass Women. And the creators of Compass justify having that because women uh, compose a very small part of the criminal justice. So their claim is that if we don't have a specific uh, tool for women, their unique characteristics um, and needs will be ignored. So ignored. So Compass takes into account economic marginalization, trauma, and other unique characteristics that are special for women. But the question is that, do we want to allow that as a society? Do we feel comfortable with having Compass men and Compass women? And how about having Compass black and Compass white? Um, okay, the second one, the second approach in group fairness is statistical parity. This one called for making sure that the outcome is distributed equally in accordance with the total population. So if I have 100 loans to grant, I should give 50 to men and 50 to women because women compose 50% of the society. Computer scientists dismiss notions that are based on, uh, dismiss this notion quickly uh, and consider the following example. So if I'm the CEO of an IT company and I'm trying to hire a couple of individuals, I might use an algorithm that is based on statistical parity. But one might tell me that it's not a good algorithm because I will have to admit less qualified women in order to satisfy the 50-50 percentage. But I want to argue that using statistical parity will actually solve other problems because we all know that the reason why we have less women in, in, in IT related jobs, prestigious IT related jobs, is not because they're less qualified, but because maybe the ads that advertise this kind of jobs, they, women don't reach them, they're not published uh, for women, or when they are, they are um, kind of designed in a very hostile way toward women. So I think it's a good example, and the same could be applied for school admission. Equalized odds is the next group fairness notion. Uh, it recognizes the fact that there is no algorithm that predicts 100% correct in all of the cases. And it's called for equalizing the errors that the algorithm make. So the errors that the algorithm make are called false positives and false negatives. And equalizing them is complicated because society value them differently. If I'm a utilitarianist, again, again, in criminal justice, I care about the total happiness of the greatest number of people, and I care about public safety. I wouldn't mind putting a bit more people in jail in order to make sure that public safety is there. But if I'm in it, focusing on the individual, I'm an egalitarianist, I probably remember that our criminal justice is centered on the beyond the reasonable doubt standard, and I have to be the most fair toward the individual. What is the error rate that our society is willing to tolerate is a very hard question, both legally and computationally. The third group, causal reasoning-based approaches, was developed because of two unique characteristics of machine learning that have been discussed here before. The first one is that machine learning algorithms are based on correlations, and correlation does not imply causation, and also the fact uh, that machine learning algorithms lack explainability. And the combination between those two can harm due process. So causal reasoning-based approaches will only take into account the factors that it has been proven uh, by experts that they cause the outcome. It shouldn't be surprising that we can't satisfy all notions of fairness. So Campus, the, the tool uh, for risk assessment that I mentioned before, it gives a dependent, each one, a score from low to high that determines the risk of recidivism. Uh, ProPublica, a news outlet in the US, conducted an investigation into Campus and concluded that it's biased toward black because among defendants who were released from jail after two years, among black defendants, People who didn't commit any other crime, 42% were labeled mistakenly as high risk, and the algorithm did the same mistake among white defendants only in 22% of the cases. 
Of course, the developers of Campus descended from this conclusion and they said that Campus is fair. The, and the core argument between ProPublica and Northpoint, the developers of Campus, is a misconception of fairness. ProPublica wanted equal opportunity. They wanted black and white defendants, low risk defendants, to, be, to have the opportunity to be classified as so. And North Point wanted individual fairness. They are claiming the law doesn't allow us to treat black defendants differently. And given the difference in the base rate between black and white defendants, the gap is, that ProPublica is referring to will always be there. But in fact, none of their approaches address the most important issue, and it is the fact, the differences in the base rate and the fact that black defendants are overrepresented in the criminal justice because of historical reasons. So what developers can do that in order to better address algorithmic fairness? The first and most important point is to clarify their, clarify their approach to fairness and to basically show whether other notions of fairness were, were examined before the chosen one uh, was, before the one that has been developed was chosen. And also having a, a much more information about the society that the algorithm will be implemented in is crucial. From the point of view of the policymakers, it's very important to clarify the laws and regulations but this is a tricky one because law by its nature is developed, is designed to be broad in order to accommodate as many cases as possible. But for the algorithm, it's the opposite. The more specific you are, the better the prediction that you will get. So balancing between those two is very important. It's also very important to audit the results of the algorithm. So uh, to conclude, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful, is a quote used uh, to teach students in statistics classes that the, the models are wrong because they represent a simplified version of reality. But what I hope I started to convince you in my presentation is that most models are right, but it depends how we use them. The variety of fairness notion is big and I expect it to grow, this, this diagram. Um, the notion that is working for credit scoring might not be the same notion that will work for criminal justice. And it's very important to be aware of the very specific details of each case. Thank you.